Welcome everyone. Thanks for bearing with me during a minute of technical difficulties over there. And uh, to kick us off, uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, how the human mind is built for a very different world than the one that we live in. And when you apply that for financial markets, you're doomed to fail. Uh, and you can put a lot of error correction. You can try to do a whole bunch of things that improves your odds of success but still you're hardwired to fail. That's the natural default. And I'm gonna be spending two parts uh, in my talk. The first part is about what are the factors at play that are gonna lead you towards failure. And the second part is, okay, great. Uh, we still can't stop trying in spite of the fact that the odds are against us. And we'll cover that in a second. Uh, and the thing is, can we do something to improve those odds? Can we build and uh, have better ways of succeeding by having a better awareness? of what our natural tendencies and proclivities kind of lead us towards. Um, it's a little bit of a talk about uh, human mind, but it's very much in the realm of investing, finance, things that motivate and excite us. So obviously I'm gonna start with a little bit of disclaimers. Uh, please don't take this as financial advice. If I say, hey, here's uh, an approach, it's here's my approach. So feel free to go tailor it. Feel free to take or leave what does not uh, apply to you. Um, I am not uh, classically trained in being a finance professional or giving tax advice. And lastly, uh, where I do draw a lot of inspiration is uh, from Jack Bogle. So that's why I am an enthusiastic Bogle head. Um, so I might tell you, uh, hey, okay, here's a good way for you to try and be an enterprising investor and try to score some returns and keep yourself safe. But at the same time, understand that at the core of my heart, I'm still a Bogle head. I wouldn't uh, advise anything uh, as a default except uh, the Vanguard uh, philosophy of investing in um, low cost, low expense ratio, broadly diversified index funds, right? Um, so all of this is a bit more theoretical, the rest, uh, rest of the discussion, uh, but I don't want to come across as a person who is wheeling us away from our core philosophy. Right? Um, so let's kick this off. Uh, I'm going to ask members of the audience to just do a quick poll on Zoom. Um, just use, use the, chat, the chat function and then the question number and your answer of yes or no, right? Um, so have you heard or do you agree with the sort of general uh, maxim that I've heard in a lot of places, which is the majority of active traders lose money in the stock market over a medium to long time horizon. I can't see the chat, so I might have to ask Greg to give me a general sense of, did we get more yeses than no's? Did we get a lot of yeses? Did we get a few no's? Well, uh, so, far we, we, so far we have everybody say, saying yes. Well, okay. one no. We got one no. That's exciting. Okay. Okay. That's, that's great. Okay. Uh, one no, which is good, uh, because I think you want a little bit of diverse opinions. Uh, so that's great. Um, but overall, I think Greg called out the sort of headline over there, which is generally a lot of people agree with the statement that most people who actively trade on the stock, mo stock market end up losing money, right? And if you look at uh, some general statistics that are discussed and available all over the internet on more or less reputable sources, the sort of consensus estimate uh, is somewhere like 90 to 95% of active traders end up losing money in the long term. Uh, if you were to dig in, you can get much more of a granular number. The aggregate doesn't make sense because there's no one way or one benchmark by which you can evaluate like everybody trading and everybody putting money into the market. So if you look at it at a much more finer grain, you what you end up seeing is, okay, futures traders in Brazil, day traders in Taiwan, um, retail foreign exchange traders, and then the particular traders in one day trading uh, application, everybody seems to generally give us the directional read of somewhere between 70 to 97% of people end up losing money in the short to long term, right? So the time or the place does not matter where some of the studies were in the 92 to 2006 periods, the eToro study is a lot more contemporary, so on and so forth. But the general theme is definitely true. And analysis over and over again have proven that when people try to trade and pick up a lot of gains along the way, they, 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 they manage to succeed in the short term, but they are more likely to fail in the long term. And that too by a wide, wide margin. And it's good to see that a lot of folks over here already understand that, right? So 
Now, this is going to take us to our next poll, right? And it's once again a simple question. So I hope. Uh, everybody over here, I'm sure, knows what an actively managed brokerage account is. Uh, the sort of key things that you're trying to do is you're trying to pick stocks. You want to try and say, hey, here's something that I'm going to pick, which is going to deliver outsized returns, maybe beat the market in the short to long term. You're kind of uh, wheeling away from the index funds and passive ETFs that we often spend a lot of time talking about. And what you're trying to do is maximize growth, maximize your returns or take a lot of profits along the way where you are actively doing uh, and taking actions which are closely associated with trading rather than long-term investing, right? So uh, the poll number two, and likewise, please go in, add the question number and then a yes or no, depending on your answer. Do you have a brokerage account that follows this test where you are actively trading stocks, right? Uh, Ravi, uh, someone asked, what is the definition of an active trader uh, and someone else agreed, uh, someone agreed that uh, active traders should be defined, if day traders, yes. And my thought was, when you talk about an actively managed brokerage account, are you referencing um, a brokerage account that is managed by, say, uh, a registered investment advisor, so they sell stocks and uh, sell and buy on their own volition, or are you just talking about a, a self-managed account where you have active funds? Yep. So excellent question, and uh, I tried to put more definitions. And the problem with putting more definitions was, oh man, it's getting a lot more technical. Uh, just go with the spirit of it. That's what I would say. And you're right, uh, Greg, for making that discussion. It could be through a registered investment advisor, or it could be yourself, or it could even be uh, a very well-known person who offers their actively traded uh, fund as an ETF or an index fund something where there's a lot of active choice in the stocks and timing, which helps you try to maximize return. So uh, there isn't a precise point that I'm trying to gravitate you towards. Think of it as trading and investing are on the spectrum and stuff that feels more towards trading into that spectrum. Those are the activities that I'm trying to say. Do you do, you, do, you, do, you do it yourself or do you have somebody do it for you uh, where they're trying to pick the stocks and generate outsized returns by timing in and out of the market? Okay, so that's that's hopefully a better definition. It's not meant to be uh, geared towards precision, but a general idea. So you feel, yes, I have certain accounts or certain equities and accounts that pass those tests. Just say two yes, or you say two no if those don't feel like what you're gonna do. Uh, I mean, you can just keep it simple. Do you do you like to pick stocks? Do you like to like uh, make a lot of gains? That's the core essence of what I'm uh, going after. Yeah, a little more mixed on this one, but most people say no, but there are a few yeses as well. Okay, okay. That is, uh, I will attribute that to the fact that you guys are much more involved, Bogleheads. Uh, so I'm very impressed. I'll, uh, I think if you read my little disclaimer over there, I don't pass that test. I try to beat the market on the side. Uh, and it's a very essential uh, part of what ends up happening when you try to read a lot about finance. Uh, in general, if you pulled a whole lot of people? Uh, the answer is usually yes. More, more people end up wanting to try and uh, have a much more of an active role in what their investments are, how long they're invested, and so on and so forth. And uh, once again, there's more evidence for it. I haven't uh, sort of brought it to the, to the, to the fore like the previous poll. But overall, if you look at it, uh, why is it or what is the motivation for a lot of really smart people to try and have active trading, even though they know that passive wins out in the longer run, right? And if the house always wins, why do we just choose not to gamble? And that's the question that we need to be asking ourselves. And the answer is, it's hardwired into us. Evolution programmed and allowed those folks to survive who ended up trying to do a lot better than the average, who wanted to not just be satisfied with what they had, but actually strove to try and achieve something that was beyond what the averages give. And that meant that a lot of us are hardwired. Uh, I wouldn't even say a lot of us, I'd say every one of us is hardwired to try and beat the odds. That's part of what drives us in excellence in every one of our pursuits, whether it's at work, whether it's investing, whether it's our hobbies or passions or whatnot, right? And in some places, it's the rational thing to do. If you're, doing, if you're trying to maximize uh, your returns at work, that's great. But when you try to do that in the financial markets uh, and your tool of choice ends up being active trading, it's not rational. Because if you look at the statistics, 
It is absolutely not rational for you to do, yet you end up doing it. And that should give you a clue, which is that our actions are driven by compulsions that are outside of our control. It's not just the pieces that you think are uh, working and pushing you in a certain direction. It's not just your uh, analyzed um, sort of pos positions on various things, which is moving you forward. There are factors that are outside of your control, which get you to do things which have very, very real, uh, real world uh, implications, right? Um, so now, okay, how, how deep does it go? And the answer is it's a hardware problem. There isn't in any amount of knowledge or a pursuit of our alternate paradigm, which is gonna get that compulsion out of you. You can know that I have these compulsions. You can know that, hey, I am statistically hardwired to watch the markets and go try to pick stocks and succeed at it. And you will still fail because uh, the embedding is all the way in the way your brain works. It's not about what you know. So you can be extremely smart. You can have a lot of knowledge, a lot of experience, and yet make these very classic mistakes. So you have to understand it as a hardware problem, not a software problem, right? So, okay, great. What do I mean by the hardware problem? And uh, what does that uh, sort of, uh, why, why does that cause doom, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and I've kind of broken it down into four different uh, phases. The first thing, is, uh, as I pointed out, is our mental circuitry was op not optimized for rational decision-making. It was optimized for survival. It was optimized to do that at the lowest cost of energy because energy meant you had to do a lot more energy. It was hard to find this modern world that we live in with just easily available calories and so on and so forth was not the one that our uh, evolution sort of taught us to uh, survive in, right? Uh, so that means that our mental circuitry is going to cause problems. And the second thing is, okay, great. When you have this mental circuitry, what does that lead you towards? It leads you to make decisions very, very, very quickly. And you're using that uh, intellect of yours to try and rationalize the decisions as opposed to analyze the decisions. So before you know it, you jump to a conclusion. You're like, hey, I need to do this. And you don't know what got you there. And when you think about, okay, should I be doing this? You're not questioning it. Instead, you're doubling down and you're saying, oh, I got, I got here, I got here on a leap and I'm going to stick around and dig into my position because I have good conviction for rationalizations A, B, and C. Never once are you slowing down and figuring out, okay, did I make the right jump or did I make a hasty jump, right? Uh, and what comes next is uh, acceleration of those failures. When you make bad choices and you get rewarded for it, sometimes you can... Uh, I'm going to just say it, uh, where you go get on the GameStop train and you get outsized uh, returns for it, suddenly you see yourself as scared, not lucky. You see yourself as, hey, I was in the right Reddit forums. Clearly, I'm very well plugged in. Clearly, I have a lot of uh, sort of inside knowledge or other areas that makes me better than average. And I'm really smart at this. So I can really do this for, for a living, right? And you're not able to tell your luck apart from your skill um, because you don't slow down to analyze, okay, what got you there? And finally, these individual failures add up. They lead to societal failures because what happens is all of us start sharing those delusions and we collectively share a view of the world, which stops being true. And we, we do this by saying, oh, here's the forecast. Here's the prediction of the world. Here's the prediction of these stocks that I'm interested in. And our world does not like to be predicted because in the long term, what ends up happening is you're gonna find that there are certain events that are gonna completely shatter your philosophy, not just uh, chip away at it. And that's gonna lead to a lot of catastrophes, right? So that's the core part of my thesis. I'm gonna break these down and talk about it uh, real quickly before we get into the second half of the talk. You make some mistakes, you double down and you don't re-examine the fact of whether or not they were mistakes. You're overconfident and it's in the, uh, in the face of uh, being ignorant, which is the toxic combination that leads people to do these things over and over again and yet never come out uh, of it in a smarter situation. So let's break it down. What's the root of our mistakes? Um, so if you've read a lot of um, uh, uh, sci uh, behavioral psychology, you, you, you'd be familiar with these terms, uh, system one and system two. Um, the sort of modern take on how humans make decisions is that there are two systems within your mind which are fighting for control not particularly fighting, they're uh, seamlessly working with each other. Um, so sorry uh, for that. In terms of what those systems are, you've got one system, which is low energy, works very fast. It's kind of your autopilot mode, and that's your system one. It's unconscious, it works constantly, it works very fast, it's intuitive, and it gives you those conclusions that you're getting to very quickly. 
as you scan the world, it's cleaning for threats. It's trying to keep you safe. It's trying to help you make big decisions very, very quickly and efficiently. And that's your system one. The downsides are that it's error prone and it's biased. So sometimes it makes wrong conclusions and uh, it is gonna be biased because it forms opinions very quickly based on what it has seen, not based on what is ground reality or what is the actual truth. So that is your system one. And although the numbers, once again, uh, you can't have a, put a precise estimate on it, 95% of the time is kind of a conclusion or a, a consensus estimate over there, once again. But 90 95% of the time, most of us are operating in system one because it's very cheap. It's very easy for our mind to keep us in that mode and help us get through our day, right? And system two is the more complex, slower analytical uh, system. So if I, out of the blue, came to you and said, uh, something like market crash, you're gonna have a little bit of a big reaction of a bit of, uh, oh, worry and fear and so on and so forth. That's your system one. If I asked you what is 36 into 42, you're gonna sit and start calculating slowly. And you'll realize that you don't have an immediate reaction to this. What you're doing is slowing down and trying to break it and analyze it and come up with the right uh, solution based on uh, previous uh, sort of functions that you learned, right? And that is your system to wet work. It's slower, it's conscious, it's very logical and analytical, and it's usually reliable. It's reliable as long as it doesn't give up. Uh, but the downside is it's effortful and it's lazy, which, mean, which means that your brain is working hard not to activate your system two. It says, hey, can system one solve this? Great, well and good. If it can't solve it, then it says, okay, system two, it's your turn. Why don't you go and uh, try to like solve it in a much more of a rational way for me, right? So. What, what ends up happening is if you thought of your brain as an iPhone or take an Android phone of your choice, I'm not uh, particular to that. And you're, you're thinking, hey, okay, I'm gonna fire up that calculator app and try to run a bunch of calculations. What ends up happening is you don't realize it, but there isn't a straightforward uh, mathematical function that the calculator sort of produces. It is gonna, the results of the calculations are gonna vary based on the battery level. It's gonna vary based on the number of installed apps, it's gonna vary based on the background and uh, what apps you have on your favorites or your dock bar, right? So that's the rough analogy that I'll use where a lot of these external factors are weighing into just plain old calculations and you're not aware of it. Now you look at these things and you're like, hey, but what if I kept these factors constant? What if I kept the battery level, fix it, did not change my background, blah, blah, blah. What ends up happening is, yeah, there's a lot more things in the world that end up happening that you have no control over, and those are gonna work against the calculations. And the worst part is the calculator application itself is not aware of all of these other factors at play. So what's trending, what you recently used, all of those other um, uh, avenues of activity within the phone are leading it to make bad results. Just substitute the word phone with your mind, and that's roughly the impression that I wanna leave you with which is there are a lot of factors that go into it, which end up uh, uh, veering you towards one direction or other, and you have little to no awareness or control over that. Right? So let's get to the next part real quick, which is, okay, great. Uh, now you know that we fail, what does that look like? And why do we double down in the face of that failure? And you might have seen a whole bunch of these kinds of uh, uh, biases, heuristics, they go by a wide variety of names and uh, categories of, uh, consistent human failure, which have been tested and repeated with a lot of uh, psychological uh, experimentation. And these are true in the sense that there are repeatable experiments and validations that have happened around the world in various cultures and settings, and they've proven not to be true. Uh, I'll give you an example of maybe two or three of the ones that I think are maybe interesting to talk about. Talk about. One is uh, my personal favorite and the most pernicious one that I worry about, which is confirmation bias. What is confirmation bias? You, you seek out information that makes you double down and continue to believe the things that you believe and you filter out the things that are gonna change your beliefs. So which means if you take a polar position of, hey, I really love this thing, or this is, uh, this is the sort of stance I have on insert controversial topic like masking, vaccinations, some hot stock, whatever, you're gonna find all of the information that justifies your choices. You're automatically gonna filter out the uh, information that says, hey, that's an irrational choice. The data does not say that, okay, this is the choice that you should be making. You're gonna filter those out. And this is problematic because in, when you make a mistake, you're doomed not to like go back and question it. So that's my personal favorite for that reason. 
The other one I'll maybe pick real quick is uh, something which a lot of folks who get a lot of stock-based uh, compensation never really think about, and they just live with, which is the endowment effect. Uh, it means that if you automatically are given something, you value it a lot more. So let's say, for example, I work for some hot uh, company, I work for Meta uh, or Amazon, and they pay me a bunch in uh, Meta or Amazon stock you're suddenly not treating it like it was just a pile of money. You don't say, hey, should I put it in an index fund or should I let it sit over here? And this is the choice. What is the rational choice that I would make for myself? You're not going to ask that because it takes a lot of brain cycles to go ask that question. You're just going to be happy with what you're given. And it's great if you're in one of those nice stocks that are performing very well. But let's say you were an employee at Groupon and they had a blockbuster IPO and you were great, doing great about it. And afterwards, the company kind of soared and a lot of the sort of performance was dragging under performance over several years. Now it started hurting you, right? That's why you have to be very, very conscious about why am I making the choices? And oftentimes you're not even aware that you're making some of these choices. So let's take a real world example. Okay, great. So you have uh, a 40 circuit and uh, on top of that, there are all of these biases that end up being. So how does that factor into your financial decision-making. I'm trying to go actively pick some stocks. So what exactly does end up happening over there? So I'm sitting down, I read a bunch of positive news about Tesla. And I'm thinking, okay, maybe I should invest in it. And then the logical question I answer when I go to my brokerage account is, how much should I invest in Tesla? And if you break it down and look at a, there's an illustrative example. So uh, two, two things need to be answered, which is how much and what. And the way I got to what was, through what's called as a mental shotgun. Your system one will answer questions in a way that you don't understand or in a way that you're not particularly hoping for. So the right question for Tesla is, is this the stock that's gonna outperform over the course of the next 10 years? And is this where I wanna put my money? 10 years, whatever, like insert your uh, sort of period of choice, right? And instead of answering the question, hey, okay, here's how the business is uh, predicted to perform. Here's how the valuation uh, uh, on the sort of present price, what, what does that look like, so on and so forth. Instead, your emotions and your feelings about the stock end up influencing it. And your feelings say, hey, I really love Tesla and Elon Musk is awesome. So that's the affect heuristic at play. It's just, I feel very positive about it. So let's go put some money in. And the more positive you feel about it, and this is the other sort of fun part of the system, which I really love, it's called intensity mapping. It takes how the, the warm glow that you feel about Tesla, it translates that, uh, that into a dollar amount and says, oh, here's how much money that you want to put in. And you're not aware of it. You're just like, hey, I just asked this question. I have a very rational reason. Somebody comes and asks you next uh, day, okay, why did you put X amount of dollars in Tesla? You're going to have a very crystal clear, very well, seemingly well thought out answer. And neither of these two things are going to be in there. Uh, and that's the most dangerous part, which is we identify as system two thinkers, even though we execute as system one thinkers. And you use all of your system two when your friend asked you to come up with a rational sounding explanation as to why that made a lot of sense. What truly went into the decision is the last thing that you're aware of, right? So, okay, great. That's a practical example. Uh, come on, aren't markets efficient? Uh, am I just selling you guys on a bunch of crock? And the answer is not really. You can actually go look at certain well-known societal characteristics, uh, which validate the hypothesis that we are all deluded uh, because when we when we let our system ones run wild, right? So uh, companies whose stock names are easier to pronounce, system one really has a thing for stuff that you can easily pick out, easily identify, easily pronounce because it creates that sense of cognitive ease, right? And uh, so those stocks tend to outperform uh, their peers who are just very much performing the same way, but are harder to pronounce, which doesn't make any sense. It's not uh, efficient or rational. There's a Jim Cramer bounce. So a lot of hype, a lot of sort of uh, near-term attention causes those stocks to go up. And the, when the hype dies down, those stocks go down and it reverts back to mean once again. Uh, and it happens constantly. Like obviously somebody is taking advantage of it because markets are efficient uh, uh, in, in the medium term anyway, right? So uh, that is yet another sort of classic irrational behavior. We've just codified and it happens all the time. Now, the last one is something that even a boglehead is likely to be uh, very much a victim to. So that's the, that's the reason I selected the third one, which is the home country bias. Uh, you are statistically more likely, or not even uh, more likely, most people invest in the stock markets of their home countries. That's great if you're an American, because the American stock market has been monstrous. If you look at all the way, 
even including the Great Depression all the way from the 1900s, so on and so forth. But if you're in Japan, if you're in UK, if you're in other places where the economy has uh, not quite grown at the same pace as the American economy, you've still chosen to invest in your home country as opposed to the stock markets and indexes of other countries. And rationally, is that the right choice? Maybe not, but still people end up doing it. So I would say uh, this is something that even I'm guilty of. I identify more as an American uh, in my sort of later half of the latter half of my adult life. And I do end up ha having an outsized amount of uh, investments in American uh, stock markets. And it's just something that you cannot beat, right? So the other example uh, that I want to do touch, touch upon very quickly is whenever somebody says, hey, I'm going to pick stocks, I'm going to do great. And you ask, okay, what is it that you bring to the table? You say, hey, I'm going to follow Warren Buffett's principles. I'm, I'm going to stay in it for the long term make great choices, and then I'm going to be like as successful as him. But in reality, you're ignoring a lot of factors. You've kind of, and this is one of those uh, biases where you've looked at the positives, but you've not looked at the whole picture. Uh, what are the odds of somebody who is as good as Warren Buffett? And Greg helpfully pointed out, hey, there's Charlie Munger, don't forget him. And yes, okay, there's Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, who have had these meteoric rises, and everybody knows them. And they're just amazing and sort of the stereotypical long-term investing icons, right? But the timing at which they came is very different. So can you apply their rules to the world today? Something I usually, I, I would lean towards, yes, their principles are timeless. At the same time, you really have to be very careful. And that's not the question that you're asking. That's problem number one. Let's add a more complex problem, which is they're spending a lot of time reading 10 kids and you're not, but still you're trying to compete at that level. Uh, okay, something doesn't add up over there, right? Uh, the odds of how many people fail trying to be Warren Buffett is massive, but you're never going to hear about them. If somebody else replicated their principles and was widely successful, the media is going to go behind them and once again try to distort. Uh, the, uh, or they'll they'll present their narrative, and that has the uh, inadvertent effect of distorting your picture of what really happens when uh, when there's a lot of uh, what do you call it uh, uh, when there's a lot of activity. Sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. So. Two examples, which hopefully sort of get you to believe that hey, this is common, you see it all around us, and yet we stay overconfident. Uh, this does not lead to humility. Instead, when uh, uh, e even though we know that we're irrational, we end up being very much more uh, uh, overconfident about our odds of success. And where does that come from? It comes from the fact that correlation is not causation, right? And our minds, however, are telling us the opposite. Your mind tells you correlation is causation. Uh, oh, you had an outsized or a monstrous 2020 because you were smart. You're kind of discounting the fact that you had a panic when the stock tank during the COVID sort of initial phase of correction in March, so on and so forth. You ignore all of the unsavory bits of your own investing journey and you start glorifying all of the successes. And the problem with glorifying your successes is you're going to come up with a rational explanation as to what got you, uh, what made you successful. So, okay, great. My portfolio is doing great. I picked some of these amazing winners. I automatically, or your mind is going to filter out all of the winner, uh, the losers or the areas where you took a bunch of losses and um, you're going to start attributing the fact that you have some unique skill and that's what led you to success, which is very, very weird, right? Uh, this is something, cause correlation uh, being viewed as causation is not just unique to humans. Even birds are very much guilty of this. So there's a Skinner's experiment where he gets pigeons to be superstitious. He gets them to believe that, okay, yeah, their actions had a result on the reward that they were being given. And in fact, that reward was just wired up to a timer, right? So luck or skill, how do you tell that apart, right? Because obviously Warren Buffett clearly is skilled, right? And the reason you can say he's skilled is because of the time frame. It's because of the fact that he's been successful for several decades, whereas my own history as an investor is maybe like, what, two decades deep, right? And how do I know if I'm being skilled or I'm just lucky? And the problem is your uh, internal wiring is going to tell you that you're skilled. It's not going to tell you that you're lucky. Uh, it's going to avoid you or veer you away from the areas of uh, the information that is harder to digest, which is a lot of people who were uh, highly skilled entrepreneurs, highly skilled investors, and highly skilled doers, they still failed. So you can be skilled and still fail is that one narrative that is never going to cross your head. Hey, I'm skilled and successful. That's great. That's good to hear. But you can be skilled and still fail is the thing that you're never going to be like thinking about. 
And uh, the other part is you look at other role models who were wildly successful. You don't understand or look at the fact that they took enormous amount of risks to get there. And there were an army more of folks who took those enormous risks and failed, right? And though that's the sort of view of statistical distributions and randomness that your mind is not capable of rocking. And when you look back at your own life, you're going to be perfectly happy to justify your failures as a result of bad timing, as a result of a whole host of luck elements that went against you. And you're going to say, all of my successes came not from randomness or luck. They came because I personally brought something to the table or I'm a genius for reasons X or Y or Z, right? Um, so the slides are going to be shared after the talk. So please try your hand at this. You can try to see if how much of a skill you can have in timing the market. Uh, this game is pretty easy. It's pretty fun. I will uh, try to uh, put the link in the chat so you can play with it uh, afterwards, right? Uh, you can try to beat the market with this, where it, ran, it picks a random chunk of time in the American uh, S&P 500 performance uh, within the last like 100 years. And then you've got to try and find when you sell and then when you buy and see, you try to rotate in and out of the market and produce outsized returns. Uh, I've done both. So clearly, if I come to you and I said, hey, I have a strategy by which you can consistently beat and win at the game, but wrong, because it's not possible. I think uh, that uh, the more trials you play, the more it's an exercise in humility. Uh, for the first couple of times, I was like, hey, okay, maybe there can be a trick to it. I played with it and it gave me that impression. But the more I played, the more I failed. So if you ever want to develop a little bit more of uh, sort of humility towards how risky it is to time the market, definitely go play the game. Right? Um, lastly, uh, here's the other sort of unsaid uh, parts about luck and skill. Okay, great. Maybe I'm not the most skilled person. What if I looked at another skilled person to invest in produced outsized returns? Great. That's good, solid thinking. But the fact is we still get the arrow of causation exactly inversed. Um, at any given time in the market, the most successful traders are likely to be those that are best fit for the latest cycle. What does that mean? Let's break it down. So you, you might think, hey, if I have, if Kathy Wood, for example, I'm not going to pick on her, but just uh, as an illustrative example, let's say she has the best strategy for succeeding in this time, and she does, right? You're going to look at it and say, hey, she has the right strategy. That's why she, she's succeeding. You're not going to look at the fact that hey, maybe it's the right time for her strategy to succeed. And if that time passes, her strategy might actually be not robust in the long term. That's the question that you're not asking. So, which is why you're always going to find a lot of news about who's the hottest stock picker at any point of time and not quite see that yeah, at any given point of time, there is going to be somebody who's the hot uh, stock picker. That's the insight that you're never really uh, going to see, right? Um, lastly, I think optimism... Uh, you see a lot of optimistic people amongst winners because I think that's what drives them to do it. But at the same time, that also leads to failure and you're not going to see the folks who ended up failing. Uh, I'm going to skip real quick on the next section uh, so that we can get to the second half of the talk. Uh, it's about black swans. What are black swans? These are unpredictable events which devastated with devastating consequences. You're very likely to remember where you were uh, at when a black swan event went down we don't see them coming because all of our existing views of the world are gonna say, yeah, that's never gonna happen. Like uh, when pigs can fly, right? And yet they end up happening. And lastly, they're obvious in hindsight, in the sense that after it's happened, you look back and you're like, oh, of course there was this room for failure. And that's the part that makes black swans very, very dangerous, right? In terms of some examples, it can be the trigger of World War I by Archduke Franz Ferdinand's assassination, uh, it's the collapse of the Soviet Union, it's the WTC coming down, the 2008 recession and COVID right now. These are all areas, COVID maybe if, uh, fails uh, some of the tests over Black Swan, but by and large, the fact that we did have a pandemic would check all of the boxes of the worst case scenario, that, that is pretty amazing. Um, so the question is, why can't we predict them ahead of time? Is it just a failure of imagination? And imagine if you've seen nothing but white swans your entire life, right? Uh, and somebody comes and asks you, hey, what, what is the typical colors of, uh, what, what's the color of a swan? And they say, it's going to be white. And the way they get their name is the fact that you can refute it by the observation of a single black swan. And all of your conclusions are based on what you've seen before. And unless or until you see or you factor in your unknown, you know, you're never going to have a perfect picture of the world. And the world is filled with your unknown unknowns, right? And why is it dangerous? 
is because we learn from repetition. We, le we learn from experience. We learn from what we've seen in the past and that's how we apply ourselves. So uh, before COVID, you did not, you were not worried about pandemics. And right now, a lot of people are overestimating the chances of the next pandemic. Uh, when those same folks would have been underestimating the chances of a pandemic less than two to three years ago, right? And uh, when people say stuff like this, which is, oh, don't worry about inflation in 2000, uh, nine, we did a lot of quantitative easing. We pumped a lot of money and nothing happened. And once again, people come in and say that, call BS on it because they don't know. They think it's going to be the same, but the world has changed in quite a lot of different ways. And there's a lot of fragilities that are present today, which were not present back in the day. And that means that what the future holds, we're never going to know. So if somebody comes and tells you, we know with a high degree of certainty, just don't believe them, right? And uh, why is it? that a small change leads to a large reaction. It's because our word is one of nonlinear responses. So if you've ever tuned a radio, you'll see that's a lot of static. Suddenly you hit on the station and then boom, it's just a lot of clarity, right? That's a nonlinear response uh, because of the uh, frequency resonance that happens behind the scene. And history does not like to crawl. It likes to make jumps. So things change gradually and then suddenly, which is why you have these explosive moments. And it might feel like, wait, it's obviously this time it's different. But uh, or in the longer time horizon, black swans are going to show up and they're going to uh, end up uh, making our lives very, very difficult. So let's look at what goes into timing the market. This is kind of part two of my talk. And uh, you have to pick stocks. You need to know when to get in. You need to know when to get out. And if you're going through these steps, you can be relatively flat and still have to fight a lot of biases depending on how things take. So we look at Bob, he likes something, he does not want to miss out on it. So let's say it's GameStop. He has a bit of FOMO, gets in, and then once he's gotten in, does not want to get out. There's a little bit of endowment effect and status quo bias working at him. He tells himself that, hey, okay, great. Maybe the moment's passed, but he tells himself, yeah, not really. I think I'm still doing good and this thing's going to go to the moon. Uh, when in fact, no stock can truly go to infinity, right? But everybody says it's going to go to the moon. And then... Uh, it increases a little bit and he cuts and runs, right? So those are the five different parts if you break it down, where you get in, you, you're feeling very optimistic, you stay engaged and you try to hang in as long as you can and things go against you and you're still trying and then you bail after a point. So you can Robert, have, yeah. Uh, no one has asked in the chat, but uh, I know I didn't know until a year or two ago, what is FOMO, F-O-M-O? -O? Oh, right, okay, sorry about that. FOMO is fear of missing out. So you see everybody else and you see the average Joe's making outsized bucks. Uh, so if you've gone to Wall Street Bets or any one of these online forums, uh, they have some really interesting sort of posts. Someone will come in and say, I traded these options on Robinhood and I made a million dollars. And my... Uh, my take home or I, I make $10,000 uh, or no, I make uh, $60,000 a year and I am suddenly sitting on a million dollars. And you see that person and it's that feeling that you get, oh man, am I just wasting my time? Should I also get on that bandwagon? I'm, I have that fear of missing out. So that's what FOMO is. It's millennial speak, unfortunately. Uh, thanks for catching me on that thing. So, I think for a Bob, you can all obviously find an Alice who has pretty much the mirror image of what Bob went through and still has a horrible time and still has to contend and fight with a lot of uh, forces when uh, she's trying to uh, uh, time the market. And that's the really crazy thing that you have to worry about. It does not matter if things go in your favor or against your favor. You've got to fight these forces no matter what. So... She takes me to the second half and I'm gonna, it's not a half, but the second part of my talk when uh, I'll give you a little bit of a, di a disclaimer that are dragons ahead in the sense that uh, I've told you why it's a horrible idea to tie and time the market. But at the same time, I'll tell you, yeah, okay, if you're gonna try to time the market anyways, here's how you can improve your odds of success. Uh, if you want to not have speculative risk, just don't do it. That's the easy option. That's the preferred option in my opinion as well. But if you're gonna do it anyway, here are five things that you can try to do, which will improve your odds of success. Uh, first up, mentally write off at the beginning. Don't play with money that you can't afford to lose. Uh, stay and easy. If you are going to feel bad about losing it, don't even uh, use it to try and type market. Don't even use it to try and pick stocks. Uh, second one, try to disconnect from the triggers. 
So we live in a world of excess information. So uh, all of our information is also pushed to us. You can't go to a dentist's office without looking at the TV. Your phone is kind of your worst enemy. It's pushing a lot of notifications, uh, Apple News, whatever, CNBC, no matter what source you have, it's going to try and feed you information that you sometimes don't even ask it for. You go to Google Chrome right now, they've got this Chrome Discover, it automatically figures out your interests. And God forbid I search for a single stock, it's going to tell me everything that happens about that stock on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So try and disconnect from those triggers because every time those triggers come, they're going to be hitting on your system one, not in your system two. That's why minimizing those triggers is going to be very, very important. And if you make rational choices, do that on a cadence that you set for yourself, not because of what you saw recently, what uh, was pushed to you or what you consumed without your own volition. Um, there are three other factors or three other uh, approaches that I'm gonna go into in a little bit more detail. Uh, and the third one is a kind of two-parter, which is, um, oh, yeah, uh, which is journaling. You wanna write things down because one very powerful force is hindsight bias, which is you look back and then you see the world differently because you don't measure how much you've, you've changed yourself between the time when you went through an event and when you look back and analyze the event, that's the hindsight bias. And it's colloquially known as the I knew it all along phenomenon. If you knew it all along, why didn't you make different choices? And nobody asked themselves that. They're like, oh, I had a hunch. I should have really listened to myself. You kind of beat yourself up without realizing that, yeah, you couldn't have done anything about it. You've forgotten what you knew at that point or why you made those choices. So that is why you want to journal and have a clear articulation of why you made certain choices. And how do you make those choices? have very clear and crisp personal rules of the road. I've shared some of my rules, which is uh, I'm never gonna invest in something with less than a two year time horizon. Also, if you're investing in a smaller time horizon, the odds are against you. You're gonna pay taxes on whatever gains you make, so on and so forth. So that's one, only long positions. Why only long? Because uh, infinite upside and capped downside, whereas for short positions, it's the exact opposite. So there's a little bit of thought that goes behind all of these different personal rules of the road. And those are my rules. Those need not be your rules, but make those rules of the road if you're gonna go down this path and analyze the opposite position. This is one thing that I say needs to be in everybody's rules of the road, which is don't just start. I actually sometimes say, you know what? I'm gonna write the opposite hypothesis first and do that analysis before I get into what I really like and what I want to do uh, because you know it already, right? That's what got you to that place. And also don't hold on to it. Don't have sacred cows. So if you like something and then your uh, sort of analysis says, yeah, you should really shouldn't, shouldn't be liking this. It's okay. Just abandon and go look for that uh, next thing instead. Uh, so that's the key piece that I'd leave you with, which is like, be prepared to abandon your hunches and be prepared to look for the opposite side of the equation because your defaults are not going to take you there. Um, Write down your investment pieces and really ask yourself what is unique or contrarian or what is something that I bring to the table over here, right? Uh, so I've given an example uh, back sometime, 2016, 2017. It usually comes from a trigger. So as much as I say uh, you can disconnect from the triggers, it's not always possible because I'll give you this real world example to get you an idea of how that trigger drives your thinking. Uh, I was going to the city a lot and then I'd often see everybody wearing AirPods. And I was like, wait, uh, the degree to which the last earnings call, the wearables was covered as a section, the media was very much focused on the sort of services aspect of Apple's business growing and undervaluing what their wearables sort of section was looking like. And I was, uh, over there, I was like, okay, fine. Is this something that I think is going to have material upside in the stock? Really went and looked at it and so on and so forth. I'm not going to share what I did uh, after that. But generally, it's that trigger which leads to that sort of thinking. And the other part that you have to really uh, ask yourself and slowing down really helps because where I went from there was looking at, okay, what are the profitabilities? Because the pricing strategy for some of these variables is very different from the pricing strategy for their more premium priced uh, uh, options and so on and so forth. So that's the hard part, which is you have a trigger, you have a thought, see it through, but delay the action as much as possible because the more you delay, the more you give your system one a chance to catch up and make sure and keep you on track to make sure that you're not making a hasty decision that you're going to live to regret, right? Um, I'll go through this real quick. Uh, know who to trust, easy. Uh, gain a lot of evidence. I think don't have, jump to conclusions and what are you doing with that time? 
time by itself helps, but what really helps is good solid evidence. And we have access to enormous amount of information if we were to just look at it. You go look up any stock, don't just look at the ticker price. That's the worst thing you can do. Just right below it, it'll give you what is the sort of, uh, you can say, okay, what was the earnings growth over the last several quarters? What is the breakdown? What is the margin? What is the indebtedness? Any question that you want to ask is readily available. You can trust smart people. So one person I love and I really uh, respect a lot is Ashwat Damodron. He does these discounted cash flow valuations. He puts his money where his mouth is. So he'll only share about areas where he's invested pers personally. And uh, the part that I really like about him is he understands the, that the market is not just driven by fundamentals. He does very strong fundamental analysis, but also layers on a lot of ideas about momentum, narrative, and how public mania drives stock prices uh, to as high, if not sometimes even more of a degree than the fundamentals. So it keeps you grounded. Uh, you need not have to, uh, what do you call it, uh, follow him, but I would uh, definitely recommend you towards go find good, strong thinkers, because I think if you want to improve, you want to find people who are further along in that journey. And lastly, uh, if you really want to get granular, if you really want to replicate uh, Mr. Buffett, there are options. You can go look at SEC filings. I've posted a sample uh, 10K insider activities. The other interesting part, which I realized was uh, really uh, insightful at certain times. Obviously, in hindsight, I've rarely found their predictive power, but in hindsight, they are very fun to watch. Uh, you can definitely find the sort of insider trading activities of senior VPs and higher ops at uh, most large public companies. Right? Uh, lastly, one thing that I'll try to tell you is try to add more rules, but add rules that cause more constraints. Don't add rules that loosen up existing constraints. Because I think if you're loosening up constraints, you're more likely to fall victim to your uh, system one. A um, couple of things real quick. Uh, yeah, keep asking yourself, keep reviewing and say, am I, where am I on that trading investing spectrum? Am I making these choices because I'm trying to trade or am I trying to make these choices because it's a firm investment that I believe in? And am I trying to make a quick buck here? That's the other thing which kept me out of crypto and a whole bunch of other stuff, which is, am I trying to make a quick buck? is an easy way for you to not sit and analyze a bunch of stuff that does not deserve analysis. That'll, that's one thing I'll leave you with. Uh, Reevaluate your impulses. So anytime your impulse says, hey, get out of this or get into this, uh, ask yourself, if I have a position, has my investment thesis fundamentally changed? So what you wrote down previously, go back to look at it and then say, yeah, it's changed for these reasons or it's not changed. Uh, it's maybe uncorrelated or unrelated and somehow I want to get in or get out. Doesn't make more sense, right? Um, so that's why you want to make sure that your impulses are, uh, um, yeah, uh, thanks, Huey. I just saw that comment. You're exactly right. So that's why I uh, look at it as it's on a, a spectrum. The top one was the easiest and the bottom one is the hardest. So it's not for the faint of heart. Uh, lastly, uh, on this topic, large dips are a chance to harvest losses. I think it's been very much in vogue to do buy the dip. And that's great during periods of monetary expansion and there's money being printed, there's access to free credit, and people are uh, buying up positions fairly easily. So buy the tip is great. But on a downward spiral, uh, if there is a protracted market crash, it's going to get you killed, right? So you have to ask yourself, okay, great, this has worked for me in the past, but was it a strategic choice or is it just riding the gravy train? That's something that a lot of smart people also uh, do not end up asking. Um, Lastly, feedback loops are the most powerful sort of systems in uh, any system that is powerful usually ends up having a feedback loop. Uh, and I think unless you are very honest about your, uh, with yourself about your successes and failures, uh, your brain is gonna tell you that you're just a genius and it's not gonna be true. Uh, so compare yourself, not against your raw success, compare against a counterfactual of S&P 500. What do I mean by that? I think, it's not enough if you put incremental effort and got the same returns as the market, then that effort was wasted. Say, what are the incremental returns that I produced? So if the S&P 500 would have given me X amount of dollars, how much did I meet or beat it by? Uh, that's the sort of true ROI or incremental ROI that you have to look at. Uh, take profits when the time is right. Uh, it's easy to be successful and say, yeah, you know what, I really love this. This has worked for me in the past. So taking profits is the hardest part. So sometimes when you have successes after you've get gotten in, getting out is going to be as much, if not even more harder. So prepare for that uh, or just don't do it. And uh, look for lessons. If you don't go look for lessons, you're not going to improve. 
So in that spirit, I'm gonna leave you folks with three lessons. First is the incrementality is gonna keep you grounded. Uh, did I produce extra returns for this extra effort? Ask yourself that because that got me out of a lot of wasted effort. That got me out of a lot of unwanted uh, sort of consternation. Second thing, how much extra risk did I take to get those returns? Okay, great. It's not just investment of time, but it's also like taking on risk into your portfolio. Was it worth it is something that you have to ask. And what if it blew up in my face? Would I be okay with that? That's the other question that you have to ask. So incrementality, your best friend, right? And that, uh, lastly, uh, the ROI is return on investment? Yes, that's correct. It's the return on investment, which is how much extra profits do I get for this extra amount of effort that I uh, uh, put in? That's the incremental ROI picture. Uh, thanks for catching me again, Greg. Um, secondly, less is more. I think you have a few successes and you think you're, uh, uh, you can't fail. And I think you will take on more positions and dilute whatever factors went into your previous successes, assuming they were like backed up with the uh, good analytical evidence and solid thinking, right? So don't let your successes today lead you to failure tomorrow, right? So uh, less is more, right? That was the other thing which I've personally uh, started putting into action over the course of the last year or so, where uh, it's great to let your success let you go crazy and you wanna stop yourself and not be your own worst enemy. Uh, the best lesson I've learned though, uh, which is true after, even after decades of trying to beat the market is, yeah, I'm happy that uh, the vast majority of my portfolio is invested in passive in index, fund, uh, uh, index funds and uh, uh, trying to keep those expense ratios minimum. Uh, it lets me triumph over my Stone Age brain by making it a no-brainer, right? It is a no-brainer to stay the course. Uh, so time in the market always beats timing the market. Uh, stay the course. Try not to get tempted by the fact that there are like good approaches or good experiments and hobbies that you can try out uh, uh, as covered in the second part of my talk. But by and large, the Boglehead philosophy triumphs. I think the more incrementality uh, I apply uh, in my analysis of my success, the more I realize that, yeah, you know what? Uh, there's a reason why Jack Vogel is a genius and I'm never going to be him, right? So uh, borrow the ideas of the best folks around us. Uh, yet it never hurts to learn. And that's the that was my end goal of this entire journey, which is I view it as a learning journey. It helps me uh, try to whet my appetite and curiosity and make me a better individual in the long run. That's why uh, I go on this journey, even though I know that there is a less fun, but much more rewarding journey that's been in front of us the entire time. So I would say uh, you don't have to try and apply it to the markets, but still try to go on your own learning journey if any of these were new topics to you. So I've uh, shared three introductory books in these topics, which are really great. And once you learn some of these concepts, you're going to see them everywhere. That's why I really love it, because these are more tools in your basket of uh, in your toolkit that will help you make uh, good choices in everything in your life. So three suggestions. Feel free to try them out. Feel free to give me feedback if you uh, are in touch with me. And here's how you can get in touch with me. A little bit about the uh, about myself and uh, who I am uh, that uh, you can find on the slides that will be shared uh, with you afterwards. Uh, thank you very much for your time. I had a fun. You guys have been a great audience. Thanks for uh, listening to me and taking the time uh, to talk through all of this.